I'll be in 2 Corinthians this morning, the last chapter, chapter 13. And the title of this message is Examine Yourself. I'm, I'm at the age now where about once a year, annually, I go to the doctor and uh, get checked up. He, they do blood tests and all that kind of a thing. And they do that because they want to check you out. They want to make sure everything's okay, that you're, uh, everything's normal and the way it should be. Uh, a lot of times people will review their finances. They'll have a financial advisor and they'll review their finances, see how they're going financially. At uh, your workplace, you may have a job review where they will uh, just kind of go over whether you're doing a good job at your job, things you can improve upon, things that you're doing well, areas that uh, need to be corrected. And uh, all those are good things. I think we ought to examine ourselves occasionally on, in those areas. Uh, but I also think that it's important for us to examine ourselves spiritually. That spiritually we need to have a self-exam. So would you stand with me as we read from the Word of God today? 2 Corinthians chapter 13 will begin in verse 1. And uh, let's read the Word of God together. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 beginning at verse 1. The Bible says this. This is the third time I'm coming to you, Paul says to the church at Corinth. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warned those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God, for we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Examine yourselves. This is where I want to focus, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed that test. Let's pray. Lord, we ask today, God, that you would anoint the preaching of your word, that as we examine ourselves, Lord, that your spirit would guide that process, Father, and that you would lead us to deeper, fuller places with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Just let me walk through some of these verses quickly here. Verse 1, he talks about every charge being established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. That's important, even in the life of the church today, because we don't operate in gossip. We don't operate in hearsay, but uh, uh, we don't hold people accountable for things that cannot be established by eyewitnesses. And he says here, two or three witnesses uh, will establish a charge against someone that's the only evidence that's permissible in verse 2 he he says that he warned those who sinned before and i warned them now while absent as i did when present on my second visit that if i come again i will not spare them and here paul's indicating again as he got, does through both of his letters first and second corinthians sin is not a, a light matter in the church it's a very significant issue and uh, he says i'm warning you again I've done before, I'm warning you again, uh, sin's not going to be tolerated by the body of Christ. It's an it's a even more significant problem in the church, in the world that's lost, that is full of, quote, sinners, then obviously they're going to sin. But in the church of Jesus Christ, sin is not acceptable. Verse 3 talks about the convicting power that Christ is speaking through Paul to them as I hope that you would recognize God speaks through the preaching of His Word and other avenues. And God's Spirit convicts. His Spirit speaks. I believe He does today. And I hope this morning as, as you gather uh, and every time we gather together as God's people that you would be listening to God's voice speaking to you. Verse 4, uh, it says that He gave Himself to be crucified in, in that weakness, but He lives in power, power over death, power over sin, those kinds of things. And then where I want to rest um, uh, today is, is with this idea where, that he t says to them to examine yourselves, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Uh, this self-examination. Test yourselves. Why? To see whether you're in the faith. 
to see where you're at spiritually. And in other words, it's not good that uh, it's not a good place when you're just kind of floating along. You're just kind of doing your own thing. That's not a good place to be. And so I've got these chairs up here today, and I want to use these chairs to be kind of physical representation of some areas in our lives. All right. So we got four chairs: chair number one, <clears throat> chair number two, chair number three, and chair number four where I think that you can be in one of these four chairs uh, spiritually, and I want you to evaluate. So chair number one this morning is, uh, is the harvest. Uh, chair number one is those that are, are not where they need to be with Jesus. They may be aware or unaware, but they are apart from Christ. They have never given their lives to Jesus Christ. They are living in their sin. They are non-Christians. It could be someone like an atheist. It could be, though, it was someone uh, like a seeker. They're seeking, but they're not committed yet. They've not committed their ways to Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. There's power in the word of Christ, and faith comes by hearing God speaking, maybe through preaching, maybe through the reading of the Bible, maybe through a devotional, maybe through a song, whatever it comes, but God's voice speaking to us where we are at in our sins apart from Him, and faith realizing we don't have to remain lost and apart from God, but we can live in relationship with Jesus Christ. And can I just say, uh, uh, for those of us that are a part of the body of Christ that are ministering, and we want to see people in chair one move to another place spiritually, uh, let's not resort to gimmicks. Let's not resort to uh, games or a uh, trifling thing uh, to transform people. The Word of God is what brings transformation. When people believe in God's Word, believe what He says, that's what brings transformation. I think the church has done a lot of diluting God's voice. We've screened out. We want to take the edge off of it. But can I challenge you, as Elijah challenged the people thousands of years ago, he said, quit staggering between two opinions. Quit going back and forth between two opinions. If, if God is God, serve Him. Do it. Make the decision. That's the call to chair number one. How long are you going to go staggering along, limping through life, when Christ has made available a relationship with Him that you could be in? Chair number two. <clears throat> chair number two also, chair number one is not a chair that you want to be in. Chair number two really isn't either. Chair number two is, uh, if you will, is where uh, we would call maybe as we looked at the church of Laodicea, uh, the, the lukewarm Christian. All right? Revelation 3, verse 16 talks about that. In fact, it says that God spews out of his mouth. He vomits out of his mouth the lukewarm Christian. And that's what chair number two is. Paul writes to Timothy about those who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. The power for what? Power for miracles? Power for... No, no, no. Not power just for miracles. That certainly may be involved in it as it communicates the gospel. But it's the power to live the life God's called you to live. You don't have to be bound in chair number one. You can live and you don't have to be lukewarm. You don't have to be quasi-Christian. You don't have to be a cheap counterfeit. You don't have to have a dead religion. But you can know Jesus Christ. You don't have to settle for lukewarmness. And God calls us out. There is a power for us to live the life that God's called us to live. Chair number two, uh, <clears throat> people that are sitting in chair number two are of no spiritual benefit to the kingdom of God. Because they're in chair number two. They are, they are people who are recipients. They are in need of a new, real, powerful work in their life. Uh, but they've got just enough religion to feel comfortable sometimes. That they're in chair number two. And God's calling them from chair number two to deeper places. In fact, chair number two is often more of a problem. They become a hindrance because people in chair number one who begin to become awake to the problem of their life and where they're at, they, they, chair number two is a hurdle for them. Because for many people, they see 
Chair number two people, lukewarm, not committed, unreal, uh, quasi-Christians in chair number two. And it becomes a hurdle. I can't get beyond chair number two. And they said, if this is the standard for Christianity, then what kind of faith do I really want? Do I want to be a part of the church? In fact, there's many churches that are full of just people like chair number two. They're sitting in chair number two. They're not committed. You don't know if they're going to show up on Sunday. You don't know if they're going to follow through on their, on their commitment to Christ. You don't know if they're going to do anything because they're in chair number two. They're in that lukewarm place. They're in that, that, that uncommitted Unreal. In, in fact, the reality is we would call people, if we really want to be honest, although painfully honest, we would call people in chair number two hypocrites because they would claim to be Christian but not affecting the kingdom of God in any positive way whatsoever. They tend to be selfish. They are preference-driven. They want things their own way. These are the kind of folks who get mad about every little thing that goes on in the church. They get their feelings hurt easily, and uh, they let you know about it, and they're always at the core. In fact, can I just tell you, if you are always at the center of every controversy in the life of the church, you're in chair number two. You're not living the Spirit-filled life, and God's calling people to deeper places. In fact, chair number two comes with a consumer mentality. They're always asking, what can the church do for me? What can the body do for me? And anytime you're asking, what can the church do for me? And bringing that consumer mentality, you're not part of the harvest workers. You're always part of the harvest. And so I want to just speak to chair number one people real quickly and say, do not allow chair number two people to get in the way of you coming to know Jesus in his fullness. Don't let them get in the way. You just skip right over chair number two and go to chair number three. Chair number three, if you will, is the chair for new believers. It's people who have given their life to Christ. They've been forgiven as we talk about encountering God, they have encountered God. He has done something in their life. They've been born again. Their sins have been forgiven. And uh, they're walking with the Lord. They, they didn't get stuck here at number two. Although sometimes number, chair number two, the, the, the quasi, the generic, or the lukewarm Christian can be really born again and experience chair number three. But they didn't get caught up. They're not going to get caught up on chair number two. They're moving on. They are discovering new life in the Spirit of God. They're growing. If you're in chair number two, if you're really in chair number two, chair number two, you are growing. Chair number, I'm sorry, chair number three. Chair number two is when you're in a place and you're not growing. Because there's no life. Where there's no life, there's no growth. Because you're not alive. Only people alive grow so chair number three is those who have been born again they're they're growing they're alive they're they they want to learn they're they're working at developing a prayer life they're working at developing faithful times in the word of god they're working at developing what does it mean to live life in righteousness what does it mean for me to be in right relationship with God? And how does that affect my relationships? How does it affect my job? How does it affect my lifestyle in all these different ways? They are working all those things out. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and truth. They're, they're trying to figure those things out. And they are a sponge when it comes to the things of the Spirit. Because they've been born again. <clears throat> Their decision to follow Christ is official. They're not hiding it. They have made public profession. I am a child of God. I am walking with the Lord. I am going to serve Jesus. And they are seeking to be equipped by the Holy Spirit. They recognize, listen, anyone who's been born again, God moves you to be a harvest worker. All right, that's where he's moving. I don't care what your age is. I don't care what you feel like your giftings are or the lack thereof. That everyone who's been born of the Spirit is a child of God and his children are called to work in the harvest field. Our calling is to reach people in chair number one that are lost or in chair number two that are lukewarm or wherever they are that are not right with God and to help them come into the kingdom. And so chair number three, people who have been born again, are new Christians 
are people who are wanting to be equipped by the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to understand what you're doing in my life. Now, one thing about chair number three is that uh, they often will, will experience inconsistent victory. Now, I absolutely reject the idea that as a Christian, you live daily and even hourly in sin. All right? If that's the case, then you're in chair number one still. You're a sinner. All right? Sinners sin. However, when you're first born again, it's it, everything new. And, and I'll just tell you, if I, if I can, if you're in chair number three and you've just recently began your walk with Jesus, do not get discouraged that you don't have it all figured out. Don't get discouraged that you don't understand everything there is to understand about the things of God. Don't be discouraged about that. And sometimes you will fall on your face, if you will. You'll mess up. You might mess up bad. But do not remain fallen. Get back up on your feet with Jesus and begin to walk with Him again. In other words, don't stay on the ground. Get back up. Keep trying. Keep going forward. Those that are in chair number three are discovering the new truths of God. They're following after Jesus. And even though there are times where they'll mess up, sometimes they may even sin, they immediately want to get that back under the blood of Jesus and be reestablished in their walk with God. They are deeply aware, as every Christian and everyone with whom the Spirit of God is working in their life, that, that of their own spiritual inadequacies. In fact, as they grow and they mature as a Christian, they will begin to be aware that there are other desires at play. While they desire and love the Lord, they also desire and love the things of this world. And so they begin to wrestle with some of those kinds of things. They begin to recognize there is a worldly bent to them. The things of this world, physical things, and things that sometimes maybe that are, that are just not pleasing to the Lord are, are, are too attractive to them. Now, you'll never get to a place in your life where you won't have, that, that you won't have tem temptation. But chair number three begins to recognize that there is a deeper work of God that they need in their life. All right? So chair number one is the lost. Chair number two is the lukewarm. Chair number three is the born-again Christian. And chair number four over here is, those <clears throat> is, is the sanctified believer. Is the person who has gone on to consecrate themselves fully to Jesus Christ and have been sanctified through and through. They've completely surrendered, entirely consecrated, and now want to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now this call, if you will, to a deeper life that is in chair number four is a call that is all through the Word of God. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's explicit, sometimes it's implicit, sometimes it's, it's there, but it's subtle, but it's there nonetheless, that there is a calling, that God's plan for your life is not just that you would have your sins forgiven so that you would be permitted into heaven, but that your whole nature, your heart, your soul, your mind, your body, all would be devoted to honoring and serving Him. And that's, that's this call. Salvation never was intended to end at the forgiveness of sins. That is the beginning of your walk with Jesus Christ. Not the end. And chair number four represents that for us. Philippians, uh, Paul writes to the church at Philippi in chapter 3, beginning verse 8. Listen to what he says. And I want you to hear it. It's, it, it's somewhat subtle, but it's also very explicit as well. Indeed, he says, <clears throat> I count everything as loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Wow! Knowing Christ on that kind of a level. That's his supreme desire. Romans chapter 12, 
Beginning of verse 1, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He goes on to say, then, once you've done that, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Chair number four are those folks who have made a, a, a total decision to follow Jesus Christ. Not just to have God forgive them of their sins, but that God has changed them to the core of their being. They have sold out. Their priority is no longer the things of this world. Their priority are the things to come. And the things that really make an impact even now in the life in which we live. They are fully surrendered uh, to the best of their knowledge and ability. They are, uh, and this is the best position for growth, by the way. This is the place where you more fully grow. So a lot of times we view our faith in, in Christ uh, uh, as being Christian as a kind of a static point. Or sometimes sanctification becomes too, makes it two points. I'm born again, and then I'm sanctified through and through. But really what holiness is, and entire sanctification, is a place where you're fully surrendered so you can grow more than you ever could before. And more rapidly than you ever could before. Uh, you've got to grow. Now, <clears throat> let me just distinguish quickly. Uh, uh, when God in sanctifies you through and through, all right? That's not finality uh, because there is more maturing that takes place. But maturity is different than purity, all right? So... You might be immature, but you can still have a pure heart. Where you are trying to figure out throughout your life, what does it mean now that God's Spirit resides with me? I am fully surrendered to Him. I have consecrated all that I am to Him, all that I have, my past, all that I could ever, and I have given it to Him, and He has sanctified me through and through. I was... Uh, 18 when I moved from chair number three to chair number four I was I was eight years old when I moved from chair number one being lost to chair number three and throughout my Christian journey you know what I found I found that the devil keeps offering chair number two the lukewarm chair I don't know where each of you are at today. I don't know which chair that you would say that you're sitting in, which chair would represent your lifestyle. But if you're in chair number one today, or if you're in chair number three, could I just call you to move up, to make the next decision in your walk with the Lord, to decide today to move to chair number three? And if you're in chair number three, I just want to call to you today. I want to challenge you today to move from chair number three to become fully surrendered to God. Just abandon self to serve Jesus Christ. Now, here's the good news. In just a moment, somebody's going to come and, and going to play some music. And uh, I don't know if you ever played that, that old uh, game uh, in school musical chairs but if you're in chair number one or you're in chair number two when the music plays what we're going to do is you're going to get up out of your chair and you're going to move three four and beyond and you can do that by coming to the altar this morning because God's ready to give you a new chair God's ready to do a new work in your life God's ready to do these things for you today if you're ready and if you're willing, would you just be obedient to Him today? Would you stand with me? I want you to stand with me. And there's going to be some that are going to come and play in just a moment.
is done. Why do you say that? 